Hello everyone, I'm back, this time to read the first chapter of Lily Wilkinson's After the Lights Go Out. Now this book comes highly recommended to me by one of my friends Shona in year 12. She recommended this last year, so let's see what you think. Let's read the blurb first. My name is Prudence Palmer. I can find water and make it drinkable. I can navigate the stars. I can light a fire in the rain without matches. I can make pretty much anything out of gaffer tape. I can dress wounds, set bones and do basic emergency dentistry. I can fish and shoot. I am nothing if not prepared. 17 year old Prue lives with her twin sisters, Grace and Blythe and their father, Rick, on the outskirts of an isolated mining community. The Palmers are doomsday preppers. They have a bunker filled with non-perishable food and a year's worth of water. One day, while Rick is at the mine, the power goes out at the Palmer's house and in town. All communication is cut. No one knows why. It doesn't take long for everything to unravel. In town, supplies run out and people get desperate. The sisters decide to keep their bunker a secret. The world is different. The rules are different. Survival is everything and family comes first. Let's see how this begins. Part one, chapter one. They're here. I look up from my book. My limbs grow heavy and my heart sinks. The twins freeze in the middle of their card game. Dad jerks his head toward the front door and flicks his wrist at my sisters and me. Obediently, we melt away from doors and windows, sinking silently into position behind the couch. Dad lays a finger on his lips, flattens his back against the wall and edges along it, disappearing down the hallway towards the rear of the house. I glance over at the twins. Grace is staring straight ahead, her lips white. Blythe is frowning at her fingernails, which are painted with purple sparkles. My phone vibrates in my pocket and I pull it out. It's the biggest, ugliest, brickiest, unsmart phone that ever existed. Dad didn't want to let us have phones at all, but we wore him down. No internet, though. Too many risks with the internet. It's a text from Anna. Blythe glances over at me. We hear the tinkle of breaking glass. It can't be any of the windows of our house. They're all bulletproof. But maybe it's the car or the window on the garden shed. Panda lifts her head from where she's been sleeping on her sheepskin rug and lets out a whine. Grace closes her eyes, her shoulders braced with tension. A heavy pounding sounds from the front door. They can't get in that way. The door is reinforced with steel bars and industrial hinges. Panda scuttles to hide under the coffee table. Grace whimpers. Don't be such a sook, Blythe murmurs, reaching out to squeeze her hand. I look down at Anna's text. You busy? I punch out a reply, my nails sinking into the spongy rubber keys. Nope, you? I hear crunching feet on gravel, then nothing. My phone buzzes again. Snuck off campus. We're going to the movies. Anna always forgets that I can't get emojis on this prehistoric phone. It's the last week of school for the Year 12s at Anna's boarding school in Garten. The local kids are all slacking off at home, but the boarders stay on to get their results and attend their graduation ceremony. I'd be graduating this week too if I still lived in the city and did normal school. I'd be signing the yearbooks and uniforms. There'd be muck-up pranks and pancake breakfasts. Instead, I'm stuck in the middle of nowhere. I'm not graduating from anything because Dad says that the school system breeds docile sheeple and, and education is a process that never ends. Grace is staring at me. She looks down at my phone pointedly. I switch it off, leaving it on the floor. A mobile phone is like a giant neon sign pointing to your location, Dad says. Always leave it behind. There are better ways to communicate. Blythe looks over at me, an eyebrow quirking into expectation. Bug in or out? I'm the oldest, so I get to decide. Is it safer to stay in the house or should we leave and head to the paddock? My life is nothing but choices between equally terrible options. I sigh and make the bug out signal with my hand, a swooping motion like a plane taking off. The twins rise into a crouch, ready to follow my lead. We stay low, shuffling silently to the laundry where we collect our backpacks. I bend over to clip on Panda's harness. It has bulging saddlebags on either side and slip her lead over my wrist before stepping out of the laundry door. The humidity hits me like a punch to the gut, sucking my energy and making me feel like I'm moving through hot treacle. There's no one to ever to be seen, only clean laundry pegged out on the line. 
If anyone ever stopped to think about it, they'd wonder why this remote rural property has a side fence and a compact washing line when there's room for a whole forest of hills hoists. But nobody ever questions it, and Dad wanted an unexposed route from the house to the backyard. We pushed through hanging sheets and towels, the smell of hot cotton and fabric softener weirdly normal and comforting. Then we run. Panda gallops along, happily at my side. She thinks this is the best game ever. I wrap the leash around my hand a few times to shorten it and show Panda the liver treat I have in my pocket. I want her to stay focused on me and not remember how much she enjoys barking at our chooks. We run past the veggie garden, the chooks, the tool shed, the orchard and the beehives, heading for a scrub-covered ridge. A sudden burst of exercise makes my heart pound and my breath tear. I reach the ridge and scramble over it, twisting so I'm facing the way I came and sliding down onto my belly into the baking orange soil. Scrubby bushes scratch my skin and tangle in my hair. I shorten Panda's lead even further, yanking her down next to me. Her tongue lolls out as she pants and I can feel her hot breath on my face. I let her have the liver treat and she gobbles it up, then gives me a thankful lick. Blythe and Grace slide down next to me and we lie there, faces down in the dirt, while we count to 100. The world grows very small and close. Hot sand presses against my cheek. Shiny black ants march past my nose. Little midgy insects buzz close and irritating. Panda tries to snap at them, but I yank her lead again. We've made enough noise that we should have scared away any snakes, but I still freak out when I feel something brush my ankle. My leg jerks out automatically, but it's only a bush. I raise my head slightly and scan our immediate area for any other threats. Bull ants, venomous spiders, scorpions. Clouds hang low and heavy in the hot air. The weather forecast keeps saying it's going to rain, but it never does. The wet season was supposed to start weeks ago, but all we've had is this relentless humidity. In a parallel universe, a version of me gets to have a normal life, where being prepared means bringing a cardigan and having an emergency condom in my bag just in case. This version of me plucks up the courage to talk to Joe DeBellis and he asks her to the Year 12 formal. I see the other me at picnics in the park with her friends, strolling through busy streets at night, flashing a brand new ID in pubs and bars, laughing and dancing under twinkling lights while the city moves and breathes around her. I pop my head up and look back through the orchard at the house. It is still so still, not even the washing on the line is moving. The air throbs with the humming of crickets and flies. My legs are already covered in scratches. A mosquito buzzes in my ear and I shake my head. Before we moved here, mosquitoes were merely annoying, itchy bumps and nighttime whining. Now they're dangerous, point potentially carrying Ross River virus or Murray River encephalitis. Up here, everything is a threat. I heave myself up onto my feet and brush dirt from my shirt and shorts. My thighs are sweaty and the dirt smears into brown and orange streaks. The ridge drops sh sharply into a gully, choked with thick bushes and weeds. We scramble down, trying not to crush the vegetation. In the parallel universe, Prudence links arms with her friends and they all throw back their heads and sing whatever pop song became the anthem of their year. The other Prudence stays up all night after a party to watch the sunrise with Joe DeBellis, entwined and in love. Her future stretches before her, full of non-terrible choices and revelations and glorious possibilities. Skinny trees lean dizzily from the slope of the gully. I duck under the low branches of a prickly wattle and Panda smells something exciting and surges forward, dragging me after her. I have to reach out to grab the shaggy trunk of a paper bark to stop myself from skidding. I get her under control and pick up my way down the slope. A butcher bird warbles overhead and nearby I can hear the soft throaty coo of a rock pigeon. The ground turns soft and spongy as we near the creek at the bottom and I step out onto the large stones that litter the gully floor. The boulders look natural, like they've always been there but they haven't. Dad put them there a few months ago and drilled us over and over again to the path, the path to take so we wouldn't leave behind any footprints. The hardest part is getting Panda to jump from rock to rock instead of just charging down the muddy bank. I scour the edges of the creek for any suspicious, suspicious dark lumps. Dad has promised us that we're too far inland for crocodiles, but I figure you can never be too sure. The lack of rain means the creek is little more than a trickle, but it's enough. I jump off the last boulder into the water, gasping at how cold it is against my ankles. Panda flops happily onto her belly in the water, her long pink tongue lapping all around her. Behind us, Blythe hesitates and looks down at her feet. She's wearing new shoes, white sneakers with glittery unicorns embroidered on the sides that Dad begrudgingly bought for her birthday.
They're already streaked with brown and orange soil. She shoots me a pleading look. I lift my shoulders in a shrug. She can't take her shoes off. What if she needs to run back up through the bush? Blythe shakes her head softly in frustration and defeat and steps down into the water. Grace splashes in behind her. Panda stands up and shakes, spraying us all with cold droplets. Blythe giggles despite her ruined shoes. Grace frowns at her disapprovingly. We'll follow the creek now until we reach the paddock. It's about a kilometre from our house, far enough that it's not easily found, but close enough that if one of us were injured, we could still make it. The route we're taking now isn't direct. Dad planned it out for situations where we need to escape potential pursuers. There's a quicker way along the top of the ridge that doesn't involve getting quite so exhausted and filthy, but it's more exposed. Walking along the rocky creek bed means we leave behind no tracks, and if our and if our pursuers have dogs, they won't be able to follow our scent. Dad has thought of everything. We don't speak. That's one of his rules. No talking until we're safe. The only sound is the soft trickle of the creek, the bird song overhead, and the constant thrum of insects. My mind keeps wandering back to Anna's text message and, I'm, and imagining her at the movies with her friends. I met her nearly three years ago, the week we arrived in Jubilee after Mum left and Dad drove us in a camper van to an empty corner of the desert and told us this was our new home. It was just after Christmas and Jubilee was as, was as it is now, hot and humid, like living inside a slow cooker. But people in small towns are curious and everyone wanted to meet the new mining engineer who was building a house in the bush for himself and his three daughters. For the first few weeks, there was what felt like a steady stream of visitors knocking on our caravan door with casseroles and pot plants and homemade lemonade. Jubilee is always at its fullest between Christmas and New Year. The mine shuts down for a week and all the kids are home from boarding school. Anna came over with her mum and invited me to Lake Lincoln for a late afternoon swim. I could tell Dad wanted to say no to keep us close, but he didn't want to arouse any suspicions. To the rest of Jubilee, we had to look like a normal family. And so I went. The lake was cool and brown and fringed with bush. A sandy beach played host to maybe 20 teenagers laughing and splashing and chatting. Long-limbed girls in bikinis squealed as boys in board shorts dive-bombed off the jetty. A Bluetooth speaker pumped out tinny hip-hop and an esky overflowed with ice, soft drink and hidden underneath beer. Anna told me about boarding school, about her dad who worked at Hansbatch, her mum who is the town vet, about life and jewel the Jubilee. When I told her we were being homeschooled, she looked at me with pity. Religious? she asked. No, I told her. My dad just has some really strong feelings about education. We stood waist deep in the cool water and talked and talked. The evening stained the sky pink and the lake rippled violet and deep enchanted indigo. I sipped my coke and thought that maybe living in Jubilee wasn't so bad after all. When I got home, Dad grilled me thoroughly, demanding names and details of everyone I'd met, who their parents were, where they lived. He was pleased when he realised that the beach we'd gathered on was actually part of our land. It gave him a sense of control. Those evenings between school terms were my lifeline. I made friends and developed crushes on both boys and girls. I had my first kiss there with Jack Biggins. Our teeth banged together and he used way too much tongue. But afterwards we laughed about it and even though we didn't hook up again, it was never awkward. There were other encounters too, a fumbling two-week fling with Cam Fisher and one evening with Maddie Brutton where a skinny dipping dare turned into something slick and sweet. An old white trunked gum bends over the creek where it curves to the right, grey green leaves brushing the surface. We pause for a moment to unclip our canteens from our backpacks and fill them with water. Then we climb up another series of dad's boulders to a rocky outcrop surrounded by dense thorny bushes. The throaty half laugh of a blue wing blue-winged kookaburra makes us all freeze for a moment. Panda growls low in her throat and I shush her with a pat. I squeeze through a fissure on the rock in the rocky outcrop and drop down onto my belly. There's a gap, a narrow crawl space where a big rock rests on a smaller one. It's barely big enough to fit through. I commando crawl in the dusty earth, smelling dampness and ancient stone, then turn and tug gently on the lead until Panda follows me. We emerge in a thicket of close-grown narrow trees. There's not enough light for grasses or bushes to grow here, so the ground is littered with dead leaves and strips of bark. I kick back a patch of it, revealing a dark hatch with a circular handle, set into pale concrete. The twins appear from under the rocky gap. Blythe looks up at me, and I can see everything she's feeling, writ large on her face. She's tired and hot and mourning her unicorn sneakers, but relieved to have finally made it. Grace's expression is harder to read, but there's relief in her face too. 
As they stand up, they're like mirror images of each other, both filthy, covered in scratches and smears of orange dirt. Blythe's honey-coloured hair is cut short and spunky. Grace's is long and tied back in a braid, but other than that, they're identical. I hand Panda's lead to Blythe and turn the handle three times, then haul upwards. The hatch swings up smoothly on well-oiled hinges, revealing dark stairs below. I pick up a torch that's hanging from a hook on the wall and follow the steps down. The air temperature drops sharply and the sweat on my skin tingles. About twenty steps down, I feel a familiar, sickening wave of panic as I imagine the earth above. Us collapsing, squeezing the air from our lungs. But the tunnel is reinforced with concrete and steel mesh. I turn and shine the, tor shine the torch back up the steps so the twins can see their way. Grace pulls the hatch down behind her and it closes with a dull thump, swallowing up the daylight and the sounds of birds. All I can hear now is the soft, squishy tread of the twins' wet sneakers on the metal stairs and the metallic click of Panda's claws. We make our way down further, 40 steps, then 50. There's another door at the bottom of the stairs, a thick steel door with a round dial set into the front of it, like the kind that you might find in a bank vault. I spin the dial forwards, back forwards again, mouthing the numbers to myself. I hear a clunk as the internal bolt releases, then I push and the door swings open. We step into the paddock. Dad named the paddock after Winston Churchill's second out-of-town war out of town war room bunker during World War II. He thinks it's very clever because if one of us slips up and mentions it in front of someone, they'll assume we mean an actual paddock. I flick the light switch and, and the LEDs blink on overhead. When Dad first told us he was building an underground bunker, I imagined something small like the size of a shipping container, but the paddock is big. It has three bedrooms, a living area with a couch and a dining table, a galley kitchen, a bathroom complete with water recycling, shower and toilet, a compact gym because Dad is obsessed with fitness, a massive storeroom complete with two deep freeze units and a utility room housing the air filtration system, underground aquifer, solar inverter and battery, water purification system and a communications desk with a laptop, an AM FM receiver and a shortwave radio. There's also an iron trunk containing weapons, knives, a crossbow and several guns. I don't like to think too much about that trunk. The twins follow me in and Blythe pulls the heavy steel door closed behind them, pressing a button to lock it. The bolt slides in with a clang and I suppress a shudder of panic. I want to make Dad proud of me, but I hate it down here, buried deep in the earth. I sink onto one of the couches and take a big swig from my water canteen. Panda jumps up beside me and lays her head on my lap. I unclip her harness and drop it on the floor, where it lands with a dump, damp thump. It's pretty heavy as it contains Panda's very own bug-out bag, a canine first aid kit, three days' worth of freeze-dried dried dog food, two collapsible bowls and a water skin containing two litres of an enzyme-enhanced water. Grace and Blythe sit at the dining table. Grace's pale skin is mottled pink from exertion and the back of Blythe's neck is red from the sun. She never remembers to put on sunscreen, no matter how often Grace lectures her about skin cancer. We wait. Blythe drums her fingers on the table. I check Panda for ticks and pull about a million prickles from her soft curly fur. Grace rubs at a cut on the back of her hand. It's not too deep, but I tell her to go and put some antiseptic on it anyway. There's actually plenty to do down here. Dad is always talking about how mental health is important in a SHTF, shit hitting the fan, situation. There are board games and books and musical instruments and a monitor hooked up to a hard drive containing over 10,000 hours of movies and TV. There's also wool and knitting needles and sewing supplies in case we want to get crafty. Dad says these old-fashioned skills will be useful in the new world. How long will we have to wait? asks Blythe. The usual, I tell her. We wait until we get the all clear, says Grace, her face serious. Blythe rolls her eyes. I wonder how Anna's movie is going. When we first arrived here, I tried so hard to get Dad to send us to boarding school with the other Jubilee kids, but there was no way he was ever going to back down. Part of what he loved about living out here was that he got to control where we went and who we saw. Family is the most important thing, said Dad. We have to stick together. And he's right, I guess. Dad stuck with us when Mum bailed. Dad would never give us up. I wonder if Anna sent me more, any more texts. There's no reception down here, so even if I had brought my phone, it'd be useless. The whole bunker is about 10 metres below ground and it's encased entirely in lead to withstand any potential radiation. Blythe is rummaging through her bug-out bag. She pulls out a protein bar and starts to unwrap it. Blythe! 
Grace's front etches deep lines on her forehead. Those are only for consumption when we're out in the field. But I'm so hungry. Just wait, Blythe scowls at her. We're in a bunker with over a year's worth of stored food and you're saying I can't have this one snack? You can wait. Blythe tears open the protein bar and takes a big defiant bite. Blythe! There's a scraping on the door on the other side and the twins immediately stop bickering. Blythe swallows hastily, shoving the rest of her protein bar back into her bag. There's a clunk as the tumblers and the heavy steel door fall into place and it swings open, revealing a tall man wearing army fatigues in a black balaclava. He stands in the doorway for a moment before pulling the mask off. Panda's tail thumps against the couch. All clear, says Dad. Well done, girls. Grace lets out a little sob of relief. Now, let's talk about how you can improve for next time, says Dad, sitting down on the couch next to me. I have done this dozens of times. I am nothing if not prepared. How interesting. That's not the end of this chapter, but I'm going to leave it there. I really am going, I'm really hoping that you will um, read this book and enjoy it. Please tell me if you do. I'd love to talk to you about it. It's such a fascinating concept, having this bunker that you can go to if, if well, if shit hits the fan, so as the book says. Let me know if you read it. We do have a copy in our school library. Thank you for listening and I'll see you next time. Bye.